Thank you, uh, Dominique and, and Katie, for uh, having arranged such a magnificent conference. It is always, for me, a special pleasure to be back in Paris. I, I wondered whether it actually made sense to talk about my topic today, the American approach to digital accessibility in higher education, because it is uh, worse to be a college student with certain disabilities, certainly blindness or deafness, uh, than it was back when the ADA was enacted, or for that matter, back when the Rehabilitation Act uh, came into law in the 1970s. Um, still, I can give you a battlefront report and uh, some of our reasons for hoping that we're going to turn the tide. Uh, as Dominique mentioned, my role has been as an attorney for the National Federation of the Blind. They've been a client for over 30 years. And the NFB is, is passionate about advocacy. And it uses all the tools in the toolbox, not just litigation, um, but education, demonstrations, uh, and uh, legislative work to secure uh, changes in the law and in regulations. The NFB determines the goals and the strategy uh, and then looks to me to execute the lit litigation uh, and occasionally uh, uh, play a role also in legislative change. The scope of American law as it applies to accessible content and educational technology uh, shapes the strategy that we pursue. Federal law, namely the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act, require higher educational institutions, colleges and universities, to provide equal access to their programs and activities. Thus, when it comes to digital content and when it comes to instructional technology, students with disabilities are entitled to the same information, to engage in the same tr transactions with the technology, and to have the information with equal timeliness. Separate access is permitted only when integrated access is not uh, possible. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, uh, information, informational non-textual uh, materials, uh, such as uh, pictures of a cell with the different parts labeled, may require a tactile graphic. Uh, that is not available uh, digitally. Or if the teacher writes on the board during class, then the blind student will need to have the teacher's notes in advance of class in an accessible format so as to be able to follow along when the teacher goes, and if you multiply this by that, the blind student knows what the this is and the that is that's being pointed out visually. So in theory, those are the rights. Same information, same t transactions on the, on the uh, technology, uh, all at the same time. In practice, few universities come close to delivering. And that's for a number of reasons. One is that before the advent of technology on campus, and that wasn't so long ago, uh, universities were used to thinking about uh, the issue of students with disabilities being for the Disability Student Services Office. Uh, and that's no longer the case. But the French prof department, when it's picking what uh, software it wants to use to teach American students French, isn't thinking about whether the um, picture of the house is, uh, has an alt tag labeling it so that when the American student hears Maison knows what the picture is that the sighted students are seeing. And the uh, admissions department isn't thinking about whether the forms for admission to the university are accessible. Uh, and they're, they're, none of them are thinking that accessibility is their job. Uh, and in fact, the Disability Student Services Office cannot perform its original role because it can't do anything about the fact that the professor is using Google Drive to send out assignments uh, uh, or that the learning management software is inaccessible. Second, the purchase of technology and content within the university is decentralized 
and uh, there is no uh, standard protocol throughout the university. Individual departments make choices about what software to buy. Individual professors uh, decide they're going to post tomorrow's assignment as an image PDF. So the problem to be solved is going to require the attention of college presidents because they're the only ones that uh, can require the attention of all the different parts of the university. And so my task has been to uh, get the attention of college presidents, and I do that uh, in a subtle fashion with litigation that's the equivalent of a board upside the head, and that generally helps to get them focused. Uh, the task, though, is daunting for the universities. A single school may have as many as 8,000 websites with the number of pages on those websites going in the tens of millions. Uh, and so the retrofitting, the remediation problem is huge, even though the problem would not have been big had they started by paying attention to accessibility. Another reason why, it's, why uh, it's gotten worse is that only a few schools have contract documents that address accessibility in the procurement of technology and digital content. But one reason stands out above all, and that is that in America, national law imposes no requirements on publishers of content or on uh, the developers of technology to be accessible. And as a result, we see in the US a world becoming less accessible than it once was. For example, uh, this is a familiar one to all of you, I'm sure. Um, uh, when I was growing up, phones were for the purpose of making phone calls, and they had dials. Uh, and then there were touch tone phones, but those were still accessible. Today, landlines, at least in the US, have soft buttons whose, whose function changes and you are told that by a screen on the phone that announces the new function. And thus, phones have made a transition from being completely accessible to being completely inaccessible. Uh, thus, as one government employee told me who was blind, she said, I know how to put somebody on hold, but I don't know now how to get them off hold. And I said, that's all right. You're a government bureaucrat. You're not supposed to take people off hold. Now. A few states do impose direct liability. For example, Massachusetts has a law that forbids any entity from discriminating on the basis of disability in conducting any program or activity. Um, and we made very good use of that. The NFB persuaded the Massachusetts Attorney General to join us in writing a letter in 2008 to Apple to tell them that iTunes U was inaccessible um, and uh, that they needed to change that. And initially, Apple responded by, who are you? But after we wrote the 256 universities that they were partnering with, that the universities could get sued for this, Apple came back to us and said, well, actually, we think we can fix this before next semester. And then we've seen that, that Apple, having had their attention drawn to this, has done a remarkable turnabout. Uh, making the iPhone 3 the first accessible phone out of the box, and then the iPad accessible out of the box with the very first version. One of the things we make use of is that uh, the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, and the Department of Justice, two federal uh, bureaus, uh, are entitled to investigate universities for discrimination and take action. I'm going to give you a race through the, the history of this issue which is dealt with in a greater uh, detail in a PowerPoint that I'm going to just jump through. But let me preview the strategy of how we are trying to get universities where they need to be. First is the stick. We sue colleges and universities on behalf of blind students who are denied their rights. We also file complaints against colleges and universities with the Departments of Justice and Education uh, to get them to take action. We did that when the Kindle DX was being piloted, uh, Amazon's uh, large screen Kindle was being uh, piloted by colleges and universities. Uh, we sometimes collaborate with the federal agencies and with some state agencies in doing lawsuits together. Those are they're some of the sticks. 
We also on occasion will do demonstrations. Uh, Atlanta Cape Community College, about which I'll say a little bit more, um, was telling blind students they couldn't come on campus without a sighted aid. We thought that was silly. So we um, had a bunch of blind people demonstrating in front of the college without sighted aids. Um, and the TVs got it all. Uh, and then before Christmas a couple of years ago at Amazon, a bunch of blind students came with letters for Mr. Bezos saying, please, Mr. Bezos, why can't we have Kindle books under uh, the Christmas tree uh, along with everybody else? Uh, and that got some attention. For entities that care about press, that can be a, a big stick. We conduct workshops and seminars for colleges and universities and tech providers and accept invitations to meetings to address those issues. Those are carrots. And we advise tech providers and publishers on what needs to be done uh, if they ask us. And those, too, are carrots. And finally, on the uh, uh, subject of cozying up, and uh, shows how puritanical the US version of cozying up is, we work with the Association of American Publishers and the American Council on Education and the American Association of Universities and other organizations to reach a consensus on legislation that would help define for the colleges and the universities exactly what accessibility means for websites, authoring tools, software, tactile graphics, and the like. Uh, and that cozying up works, but it usually requires a little bit of the mm -hmm. stick to get their attention first. Uh, I don't know whose phone it is, but you're getting lots of emails. Um, the first warning shots uh, uh, on this topic come back. Let's see if I can figure out how to turn this. Yes, perfect. OK. Uh, in 1996, the Department of Education wrote San Jose State University and said the information superhighway is fast becoming a fundamental tool uh, for post-secondary research. Information superhighway, that's a, now a very dated term. But it tells you that it's been nearly 20 years since the universities were first told that they needed to make um, uh, uh, information available to people with disabilities. Here they were complaining that San Jose State was simply using human readers to read what was on the computer to blind people. Uh, they uh, suggested that they should buy, the schools should buy technology assistive technology like JAWS uh, to be available. Uh, the drumbeat continued the next year, again with the Department of Education, uh, uh, talking about uh, the need to purchase ex things that are accessible up front rather than buy inaccessible and then spend lots of money trying to fix it. I'm, I'm racing through this because this is in your resources uh, 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 that each one of you will have access to. Uh, I want to jump, if I can, to uh, uh, in 2008. This is the, the settlement with Apple that I talked about. Um, and Apple committed to providing full and equal access to all information, interactions, features, products, and services of iTunes and iTunes services. And w what, was, what did we mean by full and equal access? Uh, at that point, we... Uh, YCAG 2.0 AA had not yet come out, and we didn't want something prescriptive that would be obsolete. And so we used the, the, the phrase, having access to the same information, the same transactions, with substantially equivalent ease of use. Uh, that had actually a f was a phrase that I had negotiated with Amazon to make its website accessible. Uh, and then uh, we kept using it, and uh, eventually the government adopted it, as you will see. Um, in uh, 2009, the Kindle DX came out, and it was inaccessible. Uh, there's a longer story here I'm happy to tell people, but George Kirscher and I had gone and met with Amazon right after the first Kindle to convince them they should make it accessible. The next version, the content talked, because George had explained all the money they could make from that, but the menus didn't, so it was still inaccessible. And Amazon asked us to help them when the publishers wanted to turn off text-to-speech, 
Uh, we formed the Reading Rights Coalition. We got the publishers to back down, and Amazon thanked us by coming out with a Kindle for university use that was inaccessible. So we filed complaints with the Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Education, uh, and we also sued one of the universities, and we entered into an agreement, and the government entered into an agreement with the schools that uh, we'd filed complaints about that uh, affirm the duty of universities to provide disabled students with the same opportunity to obtain the same result and gain the same benefit and the same level of achievement in the most integrated setting. Uh, and again, DOJ, in, in entering the settlements, used the language we used in the Apple agreement of acquiring the same information, engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services with substantially equivalent ease of use. Uh, the, uh, that was followed a year later by a letter to all college and university presidents telling them that the use of software that uh, excludes an entire group of people based on disability is illegal. I would like to tell you that that letter had a huge impact. I'm not convinced any college president ever read it. Uh, but the letter is a great thing when I'm in court, I can say, Judge, the university's known about this a long time. Look at this letter that detailed this information. Uh, the following year, uh, they realized they had not sent the letter to uh, uh, primary education people, so they sent it out again, and this time with some frequently asked questions that explained it doesn't matter that it's a pilot program, it still has to be accessible. Um, you, you just have to be accessible. Uh, I, I want to tell you, we, we started uh, pursuing universities in 2011, first of all with Penn State, and um, the agreements that we've reached all have pretty much the same uh, skeleton, which is to stanch the bleeding by requiring procurement policies that require you to buy accessible, and then to do an audit of what technology you've got on campus and make a plan to replace that, the inaccessible technology with accessible technology, and then execute that plan. Uh, and uh, I'm not, in the time I've got, going to go into all the details, but again, they're, they're in the PowerPoints for you. I want to jump to um, the, the most recent agreement, which was one week ago, uh, and that involved uh, Atlantic Cape Community College. That was the college I mentioned where they thought that uh, blind people couldn't be allowed to wander around campus by themselves, and where they also told me, well, you don't expect me to us to make the dance class and the cooking class accessible, do you? And I said, well, actually, blind people do dance, and they've been known to eat from time to time. Um, so we, we, we had an educational task ahead of us, and I have to give them credit, because what they agreed to do, ultimately, is we filed a simultaneous complaint in federal court and a consent decree. That is to say, an order of the court that they have agreed to, and if they violate it, the court can hold them in contempt. And that agreement is going to require them to do a number of things. They have to have clear policies that uh, uh, comply with the ADA, a grievance policy that escalates until someone can say, this is resolved, and the student signs off, yes, this is resolved on its own. Typically, grievance policies on college depend on the student to bring it up to the next level and up to the next level if they're not happy, and not many 19-year-olds can do that. So this is a self-escalating grievance policy until somebody can write, yes, this now complies with the ADA. Training. The, uh, People who work at this college are going to be trained on common assistive technologies uh, that are used by people with disabilities. 
on common technological accessibilities encountered by individuals, including those on websites, document formats, equipment and devices used in laboratories and classrooms. Common methods for making sure that word processing, spreadsheets, and presentation documents are properly uh, made accessible, and digital textbooks, uh, uh, course equipment, informational images, multimedia are all made accessible. Uh, they're going to be trained in how you make accessible instructional materials available in the classroom setting. Um, and uh, consideration of selecting course texts that meet the standards of DAISY or Accessible EPUB 3. They've got to prepare an audit, as I mentioned, and then the, a, a strategy, corrective a, stra action strategy, within 180 days that they'll have three years to execute. They are required to have all instructional materials, all co-curricular materials, all technology and online courses created or used by the school accessible to individuals with disabilities at the same time as they are available to any other student enrolled in the program. Uh, and uh, that can include uh, tactile graphics. Now, we did a different approach. Oh, and they must make their website accessible. We did a different approach with respect to um, what accessible was in this agreement, uh, and uh, we require uh, among the various standards are the authoring standards, uh, the ICT standards for software, the BANA standards for tactile graphics, uh, as well as our old friend YCAG 2.0 AA. Uh, so we've given them a variety of standards they have to meet for accessibility. I don't think that uh, this is going to change the way education is done in the U.S. Uh, my friends at the National Association of the Deaf who have sued uh, Harvard and MIT to require all their videos to be captioned, I think will get more attention from college presidents. But I can tell you what a win will look like, and that is when enough schools are saying to the tech vendors and the publishers of content, we have to be accessible, that those companies then compete on the basis of accessibility and say, you can buy our product safely because it's accessible, our competitor is not, but if you, if you buy our product, Dan Goldstein will never dark, darken your doorstep. And that's what a win will look like, and that's where I hope we'll go. Thank you.